You know, it's Thanksgiving. Uh, most of us have put on two or three pounds. <laughs> Some of us a little more. Because we had dessert. And it's a happy time, overall. But you know what? As, as I look out on the congregation, there's some people out there that are putting on the pretty faces. And they're hurting inside. And see, you can lie to yourself, you can lie to the congregation, but you can't lie to God. Yeah. And God sees that hurt. And when we leave today, he wants that to be taken care of. Amen. That's the ultimate goal of what God wants to accomplish today. You think of the songs that we've sang so far. I sing praises to your name. Yes. To begin to stir things up in us so that God can move. All of the songs have pointed to God wanting to touch my life so that I can raise my hands in praise and worship to him. That's the way he's pointed everything. And that's where God wants to go. But see, we've got to get past certain things. See, you know, they have this thing called uh, reality TV. And no, I'm not speaking on the Kardashians, okay? But, you know, you have these people that get everything enhanced that can be possibly enhanced, surgically or otherwise. You got guys that you know don't have a job because they have to live in the gym to have muscles as big as my thighs. And waist as skinny as, as, as my little kids, you know what I mean? They're, and, 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 and then they're, they're pointed out to us as like, all the rest of us are supposed to look like that too. Come on, let's face it, I haven't been to the gym. But they call that reality TV. Well, you know, there's a reality Christianity that is just as real as that TV show or any of these. And that reality TV, which is totally unreal, is we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and he puts us in this little box, and he protects us from every bad thing that will ever happen. Everything is going to be good. And all of a sudden, life hits, and, and it, we find out that that reality Christianity is just as unreal as reality TV. And now the thing is, how do we deal with that? And some of us are living in that portion right now where we're realizing, wait a minute, God didn't put me in that little box to protect me from everything. You know, that it's all going to be good from here on out. We're living in that portion where it's like life is really happening and I need to come to grips with it. And see, we're going to look at a, a, an individual that went through that. And it's kind of in interesting because most of the Bible stories you see, they don't tell us about that part of it. You know, we hear about David and Goliath, and David got the sling, and right in the middle of the forehead, cut off his head, done. We don't hear about that. We hear about Daniel in the lion's den. They threw him in the lion's den, pulled him out the next morning, all good. We hear about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego set into the fiery furnace and they're brought out without smelling any smoke and nothing burned. We hear all of these good things. But we, we rarely hear about the struggles that they had. Those boys had to be scared before they went to that fire. David's a teenager facing an eight-foot giant. He had to have a knot in his stomach as he went towards him with a sling. These were real people with real emotions and real feelings. And sometimes we don't see these things because whoever wrote the, the stories in the Bible didn't put that portion in. But today we're going to talk about John the Baptist. 
And two things we need to understand about John the Baptist to understand what's going on in the passage of Scripture we'll be talking about. And we won't read this portion of it, but if you go into Matthew chapter 11, verses 10 and 11, it tells us that John the Baptist was a prophet. John was God's messenger sent ahead of Jesus to prepare the way for him. And it says that no son of a woman was ever great, greater than John the Baptist. He was, the, in God's eyes, he was the greatest man that ever lived. So see, John wasn't just an ordinary person like, like us. He was kind of like up there. And so the things that he can, if he can experience things, then I know it's okay for me too. If God allowed him to go through it, and if God took care of all of whatever, then he'll take care of it at this level. And so I need to keep that in mind. The other part is, because John is in jail, when we're in the portion of the scripture that we're talking about, this great spiritual man of God was in jail. And why was, he, why was he there? He was put in jail by Herod, who was a non-Jew. He had been appointed king of Judea by the Roman Senate. And he had John arrested. The thing that he had done wrong was because Herod had married Herodias. Herodias was his sister-in-law. And John had the nerve to tell Herodias and Herod that they were out of line. Can you imagine what would happen to our prisons today <laughs> if everybody had to go to prison that said our president was wrong? And not being political, just saying, <laughs> just saying. I just had that thought when I was looking at this and I thought it was kind of funny. But anyway, we're reading from Matthew 11. We'll be reading verses 1 through 6 this morning. And that'll be the, the main passage. But it says, After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John heard in prison what Jesus was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. So the first point we see is John's faith wavers. He goes, I've been in, I didn't do anything. All I did was try to live for my God. I tried to do the things for my God that he called me to do. I told Herod he was out of line because that's what God said. All I was was the mouthpiece. And here I am sitting in prison. I'm in chains. And I didn't do anything. How many of us do that? It's like, God, I'm sitting here. I haven't done anything. I'm doing my best to live for you, and yet I'm going through these circumstances, whatever they may be. It could be with your work. It could be with your home. It could be with your family. It could be with your school. It could be with your church. It could be anything. And you're sitting in the middle of a mess because all you tried to do was live for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Or he didn't keep you out of it. He didn't put you in that little box and he lets you, he lets you live life. And it's like, God, I'm doing my best and look where it got me. Look where I am. And you know, John got that way. John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, the greatest man that ever lived. John, and he sent his disciples 
Go ask Jesus if he really says, if he really is who he says he is. He had that weak moment. <clears throat> you think about that. How many of us get frustrated? We think about, you know, we're doing our best, and here's these people that aren't even trying to live for Jesus, doing better than us. I like the example that other the, the pastor used down south. He says, yeah, you, you know, you go to Costco, and we all know how Costco is these days, especially this time of year. And trying to find a, trying to find a parking place in, in, in Costco is no joke. And he says, you go through the parking lot, you go through the parking lot, and you say, God, please, help me find a parking place. And just in front of you, right there at the front, right before the door, the door, the car backs out. You pull in, you're 20 steps from the front door, good to go, thank you, Jesus. So then we come to church, and you go like, well, praise God. You know, I was at Costco, and God opened a parking place for me. And then, you know, some of the people are going... But there's those that are in church that are going, God, why do you answer his little parking lot prayer? And my family is falling apart. Why do you answer his little parking lot prayer when I'm struggling without a job? Why do you answer his little parking lot prayer when my someone in my family, or even me, is dying of cancer? That little parking lot prayer is un so unimportant. You answer him, but you don't take care of me. And we're like John. It's like, God, are you really who you say you are? But look at how Jesus answered them. And I think it's important that we understand this. Because God is not offended when we're honest with him. God, I'm hurting and this doesn't seem right. God, are you really who you say you are? Are you really? Because it doesn't seem like it right now. We're not questioning his godliness or who he is. We're just questioning, it's like, God, it doesn't match up. And then, of course, when we get into that area, you know, Satan has a field day. Oh, you heathen. If you really believe, you wouldn't be like that. It throws the little neck rope. But you know, God is not so insecure that it bothers him when we have issues that have to be worked out. He didn't ask him, what in the world are you doing here? You know better than that. You go back and tell John to grow up. He's the greatest all that has ever been. Tell him to live like it. That's not how Jesus responded. And when we come to Jesus legitimately and say, you know, I'm struggling, God. Are you really who you say you are? He doesn't kick us to the curb. He understands that. In fact, you know, you go into Hebrews, it says, he's been tempted in every manner that we have. On the cross, he said, my God, why have you forsaken me? He said, my God, if possible, let this cup pass from me. Yeah. He struggled with these things. So when we go before him, he understands. Amen. So he doesn't push us away, but he draws us to him. Amen. But you look how Jesus Addressed it. Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Go back to him. And he encourages him. He's encouraging them. Go back and tell him, I'm who I am, who I say I am. Look around you. Look at the fruit of it. Look at the signs of it. Not just in your little prison, not just in that little corner of the world, but you look at it in the bigger, at the bigger picture. 
And I am being the God that I said I would be. I will continue to be the God that I said I would be. And even in your circumstances, I will be the God that I said I would be. Yeah. It doesn't change. Our, our circumstances do not dictate who God is. So he sent the disciples back to John. But I think something really important you have to see here, though. He didn't change John's circumstances. The disciples went back and told him what Jesus had said. And John was still in prison. Sometimes we have to go through the things that have been put out there. And my question would be, why? You know, God, it would be real easy. You know, we, we read in, in Acts where, where the Apostle Paul, God opens prison doors and he walks out, you know. He, and, or Peter. And, but, I mean, he walks. You have all of these things where if God wanted to take John out, he could have taken him out. But yet he's kept him there. Why? It doesn't seem to make sense. But I put this out. I think the reason God doesn't take us out of certain circumstances is because we will never learn how great God is really is and what God can really do if he babysits us. If he takes us out of every mess so that we really don't have to believe, we really don't have to find out he's the God that he said he would be. We don't have to struggle and overcome. We will never become the Christian or that he's called us to be. The, uh, the man or woman that he's called us to be. So we have to go through some of these things. And God knows that. <coughs> the other reason is because there's people that need to see examples of Christians going through that. So that they will know everything is going to be okay. Or like maybe I'm falling apart. I'm going through the same thing they did. And they were okay. So maybe I better go talk to them and find out what's going on. And it gives us the opportunity to share our faith. And not just our faith, but it gives, gives us a chance to share our God. Yeah. And when you've been there and you can really tell them, you know, we don't say, well, the Bible says... And that's, that's, that's good and that's real. But when you can tell them my life and I've lived it and I know it. And if you do it, you will be okay because I've been there. Yeah. That's a big difference. A big difference from just reading a book. God puts us in situations. But he has, he has a reason for it. Go to Jeremiah real quick, 29.11. It's one of the ones you need to underline in your Bible. Because when we're going through stuff, sometimes we have to kick back and, and remember, this is like one of those building block ones for me. When I, when I can't, uh, when it doesn't make sense, and it doesn't add up in any way, shape, or form, this is one of the scriptures that comes to mind. Jeremiah 29, 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. This was a promise that was given to Israel. They were going to go into captivity. They were going to be under the Babylonians for 70 years. And then God would bring them out. And that's what he told them. I know the plans I have for you. And if he gave it to the nation of Israel, that means that he gave it to the Jewish people. And if that promise went to the Jewish people, and my Bible tells me that I am a Jew by adoption, then this scripture applies to me and to every other Christian sitting in this room. 
It says, I know that I have a plan for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. So as Peter sits in jail, I know that I have a plan for you, Peter. As some of us go through whatever issues we're going through, I know that I have a plan for you, Greg. I know that I have a plan for you, Aurora. I know that I have a plan for you, Fro. I know that I have a plan for you, Noel. I know that I have a plan for you. We're not here by accident. The circumstances that we're going through are not an accident. Nothing in our life is an accident because it is part of the plan of God for each and every one of us. So what do we, where do we go? What do we have to do with it? We have to accept it. You know, there's a saying that kind of goes around, and I really hate it, but it does kind of fit. It says it is what it is. <laughs> and see, that's okay when it applies to somebody else. It's going to be okay, sister. It's going to be okay, brother, because it is what it is. Just accept it. But when you're the one going through it, and it hurts so badly, and you're the one that has to accept it and say, okay, God, but I know that you have a plan for me. As bad as I'm hurting, I know that you have a plan for me. And if this is part of your plan, I'll do it. That's what the accepted is. If this is part of your plan, I'll do it. Because God is still on the throne. That's right. And nothing's going to change that. Job or no job, God is still on the throne. And the Bible says, my God will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. And he's still on the throne. And his promises are still true. Yes. And he has a plan for me. Yeah. And I will hold on to that until the day I die. Yeah. And sometimes that's what it takes. We just got to hold on. God, it still don't make sense. But you have a plan for me. And I will hold on to your promise. I will hold on to it. It may seem unfair. But who said God had to be fair? He sees the big picture, and he has a plan for you. And he may have to do certain things to get you to where you need to be. Confront you with certain issues in your life. Or put you in situations that you can take care of. It, it may seem unfair, but that's the way that it has to be done so it can be taken care of properly. God's not bound by our, our circumstances. And when in doubt, I go back to Jeremiah 29, 11. I know that you have a plan for me. And if it ended right there, that would be cool. But then we would still be doing that reality Christianity. Because if you go back up into chapter 14 of, of Matthew, we find that John the Baptist was beheaded. You go, what? He did all this, and, and you're saying God has a plan, and we look at the scripture and it says, um, 2911, plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future head gone. Because see, that scripture applied to John the Baptist just like it would apply to us. And the tendency and the problem is, is we tend to look at the scriptures in the court, or just like they apply to earth in the 2000s. 
And you think about it. God did have a plan for John the Baptist. He brought him through that whole uh, situation. He brought him through the whole beheaded situation. But you know what? John didn't lose anything. If you look at the broad spectrum and the big picture, Pharaoh or Herod really did him a favor. He's went to heaven. He didn't have to deal with all of that stuff. He didn't have to wear camel hair no more. He didn't have to eat locusts and wild honey anymore. He was in heaven. He had it good. God actually did have a plan for his future eternally. We have to look at the bigger picture. Sometimes it's just going to be nasty by our standards. Sometimes you may just be terminated at your work. And that's no fun. I went through a place where they just let us know we're closing down in three months. Out of work for a year, you know, unemployment runs out, all of that. It's no fun. But you know what? Looking at it from this side of it, I can tell you honestly that every step of the way, even when I didn't see him, my God was there. Yeah. Yeah. And as you go through the things and it doesn't seem right, I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know. But I can tell you from the bottom of my heart that every step of the way, God will be there. Yeah. Even when it doesn't seem like it. Why? Because I know my God has plans for me. Plans to prosper me, whether it's here on planet Earth or in heaven. He has plans to prosper me. Not to harm me. Yeah, they, they can do whatever they do to this body, but they can't harm the stuff that makes Claudio who Claudio really is. Because that belongs to God. I don't look for, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, I want to die. I'm not saying, go ahead and shoot me, stab me, whatever. Because I want to be around as long as possible. But I don't have to live in fear. Because I understand and I know and I've come to accept that my God has a plan for me. He has to give me hope, plans to give me hope. I have hope. He has plans to give me a future. i got an eternal future. Yeah. I'm not worried about the home in heaven. That's all good. You know what I'm looking forward most about heaven is being with God. Yeah. You know, we think that it should be just, you know, like the John being beheaded. We think that these things shouldn't happen to Christians. But you know, the scripture tells us when it rains, it rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. Yeah. That's right. And today I was remembering um, several years ago, many years ago, we had went to a, a funeral in the, the city of Paradise where the fires had gone through. And I thought about it this morning, so I flipped online real quick and I checked. And the church where they had the, the funeral was an Assemblies of God church. And again, in a perfect, real Christian world, notice I put the real in quotations, the fire would have gone like here, and the fire would have gone right here, and the church would have been perfect with all of the green grass still in the middle. Church burned. Yeah. Don't rebuild. Pastor said, don't, we're going to rebuild. But there will be things that come out of that that they will be better off as a church body after they've gone through it than they were before they started. Yeah. There will be a closeness there that wasn't there before they started because they had to work together and pull together. Now, I wasn't here when they originally built the sanctuary. 
But you hear the ones that were here and came through it. And they go like, we didn't put, we sold a lot of tamales and a lot of lumpia to make the, to make the payments. But to them, there's a, there's a closeness there because they went through that that the rest of us didn't have to go through. Yeah. But it's that type of thing. You, 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 you see things of like the soldiers, you know, that have gone to war together. And because they fought together and had to rely on each other, there's a bond. And when you have stuff like this that happens in churches, there's a bond because we have gone to war together and we won. And when I'm in doubt, I go back to Jeremiah 29, 11. But there's one last scripture. And this is the one that grabbed me. Because, I mean, I've read the Bible. I've read that scripture at least five times or more. I've heard this passage of scripture preached on more than once. But there, there's this last scripture that I didn't, it, it just, I, I got an understanding of what it was talking about. Because this is what Jesus says. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. And that, normally you just kind of run past that scripture. But think about that. Why would anybody fall away from the kingdom of God because of Jesus? I'm trying to find Jesus. Why am I going to fall away? Because of Jesus. And to close it up real quick, you'll be home in time for the game. <laughs> we have to understand that when God has a plan for our life, that his plan for your life will be done his way. And if you can't handle that, you can fall away. So it's going to be done his way. It may seem unfair, but his plan for your life will be done his way. It may put us in undesirable circumstances, but it will be done his way. Mm -hmm. The way things will be done are his way. And in the course of God doing things his way. And then to paraphrase it just a little bit. It says blessed is the man who doesn't fall away. Because I am doing things my way. Take the encouragement like Jesus sent to John the Baptist. There are people here today that are hurt like John the Baptist was hurt. I'm going to ask everybody to close your eyes.